Welcome to the BAA Solar Section meeting, which we are holding as a webinar due to the coronavirus restrictions. Uh, this is being held on Zoom and live streamed to YouTube, and the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we'll be making the recording available a few hours after the meeting once YouTube posts it. Um, and you can answer any questions by typing into the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I'll also look out for comments on YouTube in case anyone on YouTube wishes to ask any questions. And it's my pleasure to now hand over to Alan Lorraine, the president of the BAA. Thank you much indeed, Andy, and thanks for acting as administrator for the uh, the webinar this afternoon. That's it's really good of you. Um, the solar section has always had a, a sort of a, uh, a place in my sort of affection. It's the uh, one of the sort of was the section sort of I joined when I first started in the BAA, uh, and I've always enjoyed both eclipses and and also looking at the sun. It was when the children were younger. It was far more. Um, family friendly to be sort of looking at uh, looking at the sun during the day rather than staying up late at night. So that's, uh, and I was remember, I see that Guy Hurst is uh, is is on the the call and and the story that sort of that I was doing a present presentation with Guy sort of um, many years ago and and decided we'd do a uh, a sunspot count on the screen and uh, one of the pictures I had was uh, actually the same picture but was reversed around the other way and upside down and so the people managed to get different sunspot counts for for both of the pictures which was quite interesting so um, well, no, without further ado I'd like to uh, I want to thank um, Lynn Smith for for arranging this it's obviously difficult times when we can't meet face to face but um, credit to Lynn for, for setting this up uh, and also for Peter Meadows and, and Kevin for for agreeing to do talks this mm. afternoon and what I'm sure will be a, a, an interesting afternoon for us and and looking at the weather outside team and with rain I think it's, it's, it's not much else you can do on a, on a, on a cold and wet um, Saturday afternoon so without for, further ado thank you for joining us uh, and I'd like to hand you over to, to Lynn Smith the uh, solar section director thank you Lynn thank you Alan I'll just share my screen In a second, I get the slideshow working. <clears throat> Great, okay. Well, welcome to the uh, solar section meeting. At least uh, something positive has come out of this pandemic and we're able to hold some Zoom meetings. So uh, if you enjoy this today and it's a bit of a success, maybe we could uh, have a more uh, regular meetup online. If you hear these strange noises in the background, I've got two bored Labradors. So if there's a bit of whining, just ignore it as I shall try to do too. Right. Um, an update then. Let's have a look at what the sun's been doing. Well, this is hot off the press today, and you can see we have uh, in the northeast quadrant, just uh, near the limb, a new sunspot, um, AR2803. Uh, you can probably see it with a magnifying glass. It, there is a collection of rather small spots in there, a little bit of uh, faculty to, to see. Um, on the 18th, we had uh, another one um, in the north uh, west quadrant, uh, which would be quite near the limb by now had it survived, but it faded yesterday. And um, I think I can show you a picture of that. Oh, yeah, just first to say that um, we've had quite a lot of Southern Hemisphere um, sunspots occurring since this cycle, cycle 25 started a couple of years ago. Um, but all the Northern spots have been sort of far between and, and very small. But interestingly enough, we've only had three groups in February so far, and all three have been in the Northern Hemisphere. So maybe that's a good sign that the North is about to ramp up some activity and join the South in some more developed spots. So uh, thanks to Carl Boron for sending this in so quickly. So that's the faded spot. And you can see he took this image of it on the 18th. And again, there's not a lot really to see, BXO type spot um, and a, an HA um, image of it underneath just showing the uh, configuration um, in, uh, in H alpha. Um, and that is this morning's uh, gong image. So again, in the northeast quadrant, you can just see some slight plage near that prominence, but you can note all those nice filaments in the Southern Hemisphere. So although there's uh, no active regions going on there, there's still things to see. Really nice long streamer there, mid disc, uh, and a filiprom on the um, southeast uh, limb there as well. So let's have a little look back at cycle 25, really, um, and uh, just at the end of cycle 24, and just see how this new cycle has developed. So the end of cycle 24 revealed that it was one of the weakest or the weakest for the last 100 years or so. And on average, all the sunspot groups within it were the smallest for 100 years when you measured it in millions of square hemisphere. 
Now, the interesting thing was that at the end of cycle 23 and 24, although there was a long and very deep minimum in white light, very little was going on. In H-alpha, there was quite a lot going on. I'm sure you know that from your own observations. But uh, on this particular uh, minimum from 24 through to 25, we've had very, very little going on in H-alpha for long periods of time. And it's been quite unusual to record you know, zero in white light, zero in H-alpha, not a single prominence or filament or anything else to, to see. So I think that's a little unusual. Looking at our chart supplied here by Cook, and we can look back on the, the last four cycles. And straight away, you can see the cycle on the right hand side, cycle 24, um, which is quite low compared to the previous three. So it's going to be interesting to have a look at, uh, at how cycle 25 develops. Um, you can he see here a butterfly diagram. I don't know uh, my screen. I've got panelists down the right hand side, so I can't quite see the right hand side of it. Um, and if you can't too, then what it shows you is the old cycle spots um, leading away from cycle 24 here down to cycle 25 and the new cycle spots coming in at a higher latitude. So both sets of spots existing on the solar disk at the same time. The new cycle spots have not been particularly high. Um, nothing has really gone over 40 degrees latitude north or south. And some have been quite remarkably low, as we'll see soon. So going back then to the start, the very first sign of the cycle starting anyway, it was nearly three years ago now, um, and the first active region popped through. Um, it wasn't a sunspot, so it wasn't the official start of the cycle, but it gave us a, a heads up that something was about to happen. So south 31 and 14 degrees west of the central meridian uh, puts it probably somewhere around about here. But it was... Uh, over a year later, when the cycle got uh, its official start, and that's in July 2019. So we've been going now for coming up for a couple of years this summer. Um, the first sunspot popped up, a BXO type sunspot, as you would expect it to be quite small. Uh, again, in the southern hemisphere and east of the central meridian. So that places it somewhere like down there. So we do know that the first sunspots of the new cycle emerge around about 18 months before the current solar cycle ends. Um, and that gives us both sets of sunspots on the disk at the, at the same time. We're just coming to the end of that period now. I haven't noticed uh, an old cycle spot for some time. So if I sort of put my head on the block and say, I think the old cycle's ended, probably we'll get an old cycle spot tomorrow just to prove me wrong. But uh, it looks rather like the old cycle has faded now and we'll be having just the new cycle spots from now on. So new cycle sunspots appear around about latitude 25 to 30. Um, but when when the old cycle ends, we can look forward to the spots going up in latitude a wee bit. So up to about 30, maybe 35 or even beyond. So that's something to look out for. Uh, and particularly, as you'll see towards the end of, of this update, um, there is something going on as regards the theory for the, uh, for the new cycle and sunspot latitudes figure in that. So observations, please, for any high latitude sunspots north or south that you find. So this was it, this was the moment we waited for, and uh, there you can see in white light on the left, um, that's it, the first spot of the, of the cycle. So uh, very significant in its own way, not really a lot to look at. And in H-alpha, there we can see some magnetic configuration um, and we can also see some plage associated with it. Um, Mick Nichols uh, sent in a, a picture of it in calcium K-line, so we can see uh, quite a fair bit of calcium plage with it and just about see the sunspot therein. We had to wait a good time um, for the next one. We had plenty of old cycle spots, of course, um, but it was Christmas Day until we got the next one appeared, South 29, so around about where we'd expect it to be. Again, another BXO type spot. Um, a nice picture there, Gary Palm showing the magnetic uh, com um, configuration of that uh, sunspot. And you can see the uh, uh, stretched um, spicules, which we call fibrils, etching out there the uh, magnetic configuration. Now this one was significant in its own way because it's our first northern hemisphere spot and that happened on the 1st of April last year. So we had quite a wait really, nearly a year before the northern hemisphere got going, but that's not unusual because we usually get a peak in uh, one hemisphere and then a peak in the other, so one lagging behind the other is quite, quite normal. Um, North 28, so again, that's okay, that's what we were expecting. 
And again, a very nice picture in H A of that spot um, from from Gary. So we know that all new spots coexist, and we know that old cycle sun spots will be near the equator, and new cycle sun spots will be higher up to about 25 to 30 latitude. Right, okay, so as soon as we set ourselves a rule, what happens? Um, April uh, this year, or last year rather, um, we have this cycle, um, cycle 24 spot, as you can see there, 2760, which appeared at South 7, which is fine. That's about where we expect an old cycle spot to be. And then the new cycle spot, we know it's new cycle because it displayed reverse polarity in the same hemisphere. Um, and there it is at South 17. So that's pretty low latitude for a, a new cycle spot, not really where we expected it to be. And there's been quite a few of those. Well, we know the new cycle's getting going because uh, Stereo A showed us uh, the first M-class flare cycle 24 back in May. Um, that was behind uh, the limb as far as Earth viewers were concerned. Uh, so it flashed off this lovely flare uh, and we waited for a couple of days with bated breath for it to appear around the limb and it did and it faded and it was absolutely nothing at all. So that was a, a huge disappointment. And then in June, uh, we have this sunspot um, 2765, which came around again, the uh, south uh, southern limb. I think I put that an error on there, southwest limb. That would be interesting if it appeared over that. It obviously came around the southeast limb, not the southwest. Um, and you can see there, so it's the first uh, significant sunspot of the cycle, the first one that was trying to form uh, a penumbra. And in fact, a few days later, it did fully form penumbra. So that was our first substantial. Uh, sunspot of the new cycle. Um, we've had some pretty reasonable prominences too. This one in particular last July, um, imaged there by Dave Tyler, and the following day it did extend it even more and, and Carl Bora managed to capture this one, which is I think a superb image of it. Unfortunately, or fortunately, if you managed to see it at the telescope, it lifted, um, so it wasn't available for viewing the following day. Um, now, this sunspot here was, uh, although it's, again, nothing particularly wonderful visually, um, occurred in October, but it was significant because it was the first one that managed to survive from the eastern limb through to the western limb. And in H-alpha, you can see there's not really a lot going on, not a lot of development, we haven't got much plage with it, um, but we did have a very large prominence on the sun on that particular day, uh, up there on the northeast limb, and uh, again, Carl Boran managed to capture that rather beautifully, so lovely picture. Now, uh, this particular one, we have to wait until October uh, for 2778, that materialised mid-disc, um, and then it developed quite rapidly, as you'll see in this short sequence. Following day, it was really going, so with lots of action there. Um, and then it started to develop even further. And I thought, this is going to be fantastic. It's really going to develop uh, beyond that. But then the following day, what happened to it? It just sort of split into two. All the activity in the centre part disappeared altogether. But the interesting thing was that overnight, 2779, um, developed uh, just off its uh, northeast um, follower. So I'll just play that again for you just to see the development, how nice it went. Then it just stopped growing altogether and this sudden development of this other sunspot. Um, and because it was so young and developing, of course it cracked off a very nice uh, C-class flare, flare uh, captured nicely here by Andy Devy. Now the largest group uh, of the cycle up to that point, um, and that was early November, came around 2781. And you can see that for this point in the cycle really was pretty, pretty good and well developed. Nice uh, image there from Brian Hall showing three main components. Um, lots of sort of detached umbrae in the center there and some pores. So showing us that there's plenty of room for development. Uh, and in H alpha, there's probably a, a good chance of flares going on. Um, um, and just almost improve that point. Um, a very nice picture here, again, by Carl Boron, a uh, white light image on the left and the H alpha image uh, on the right. And you can see some bright spots in there. We can do a close up here. Uh, and these are, are mini flares or element bombs. And Sherry Lynn Carl also caught uh, those element bombs, um, probably a more developed flare there in the follower as well, um, also on the same day. Wonderful picture there of that magnetic configuration, really etched out by the magnetic fields of that sunspot group. 
Um, and Stuart Green sent in this uh, rather nice picture in three different wavelengths of calcium kaolin, white light and H-alpha, just showing the extent of the plage around that particular sunspot. And again, um, just a, um, a close up there and again um, sent in by Sherilyn Carl, just showing the extent of that calcium plage for that uh, developing group. Um, Mick Jen Jenkins also caught it, which I think is a, also a very nice picture, again showing all that uh, um, detached uh, penumbra in the centre and, and pores, which we can expect really to, uh, to give us quite a lot of activity, because that's somewhere down there will be the neutral line um, where polarity changes in a bipolar spot. So that's where we're likely to get shearing and we're likely to get solar flares. Now that was the largest sunspot until uh, the end of November and up came this, uh, this huge uh, naked eye sunspot and Philip Tozy in France caught it really rather nicely as it came over the limb. Um, and even that one in the bottom left there, um, it looked quite benign, um, but it, it released quite a really nice sea flare. So though it didn't look uh, too exciting in white light, it, it certainly performed on its, on its way around. So you can see the development there. Um, you can see quite nicely, you've got the faculty uh, surrounding both those spots, quite intense, um, extensive faculty. And if I just play the sequence a little bit further, again, a nice picture from Philip. And in H alpha, just see that, you can just see some followers now from the large spot, just starting to develop. And this signature that had this really sort of nice kidney shape to it. And again, we can see it there in all three wavelengths and the extent of the calcium plage um, surrounding both of those groups. So let's play this sequence. You can see again, there's some more development uh, to the rear of that sunspot there. And also watch this area here, because this also was a developing area. It didn't contour an awful lot, but it certainly had a, a bit of potential. Um, in H-alpha, again, we can see some plage with it and this really rather nice curved filament, which was associated with that sunspot for a couple of days. So I'll just play this sequence. There you can see 2788 now starting to form and probably better see it in close up there. Incidentally, you can see this sunspot starting to form light bridges and starting really to, to possibly break up. So I thought, but then it seemed to reconfigure. As you can see there, it's kind of reconfigured uh, and the fragmenting penumbra started coming back together again as well. And, uh, and so it, uh, in re, sort of reinvented itself. And then we've got all this following material here as well, which is well developed. Um, and, and this group, that's probably about the, the best it got before it started to fade again. As you can see, following day starting to fade and it's just, just gone now really. And so it's the followers to, to the main group as well, they're starting to fade too. Um, nice image of it in, uh, in H alpha there, showing its, uh, its surrounding and associated filaments. And also in uh, calcium kaolin, you can see the extent of it there. Now, also um, this year, in the middle of December, not uh, many folk managed to make it because of the pandemic, but there was a total eclipse over in Argentina. And uh, Nick James and one or two others from the BAA managed to make it across and sent back these uh, rather superb images. So it's nice to know that someone made the eclipse. Um, that brings us up really to December now, um, and we had these two sunspots appeared. So if I just play a sequence of these, you can see again the calcium plage associated with it. Um, Christmas Day, this was quite an interesting one. Um, there we have it in calcium kaolin, but just sort of watch its development as it goes across. It starts to turn there. So it's north-south aligned, and now it's turning to east, more east-west aligned and starting to fade, and it fades away there. And then almost so like 27 days later or thereabouts, we get this sunspot developed in January. And again, it's configured in very much the same way, two small penumbral spots north to south. And we see some flaring activity in that um, following group. It didn't really develop into very much more. It's this one really I'm watching. And again, if I play that sequence, we'll see what happened to it. So we'll line north, south, and then it starts again to go to an east-west configuration. 
So that's quite interesting. And it's also interesting to note the coordinates of both those two spots around about sort of uh, a month apart or just under a month apart. Um, they were both south 17. And the first one was at 319 degrees and the second one was 336 degrees. So I'm not suggesting for a minute that one survived um, a second rotation being so small, but I'm just wondering, maybe Kevin can inform us of this, but it's all part of the same VMR, perhaps the sort of magnetic signature um, carried on and existed and caused that second spot to develop on the second rotation and behave in much the same way as the first. That's just speculation, but you know, it might be interesting if Kevin can perhaps speculate on that as well. Um, and we have this from uh, Roger Samworth. You'll have seen this from the newsletter a few times of these uh, uh, bubbles, these prominence bubbles. And we've not really, I think, come to a conclusion as to what they are. Are they uh, very short-lived um, post-flare loops or are they something else? Um, I'm not going to go into any more of that at the moment. You can see we've got another one up here, another one uh, down here. Um, and I think Roger's going to join us in the fourth session and uh, present a few more slides and have a little chat about what he thinks they are too. So just to conclude, what do you think so, uh, cycle 25 is going to look like? How is it going to develop? Well, there are two studies that have just come out, of course, um, giving us some idea. Um, and one of them is of the termination event. And that's the end of the 22 year magnetic cycle. And this suggests that cycle 25 is going to be one of the strongest on record. This is all to do with the, how the uh, magnetic end of the 22 year cycle, if the transition is quick, then it's likely to be a very strong cycle. And this one apparently was a quick transition. Now the prediction here is that early sunspots should be higher than 40 degrees uh, north or south. Now we haven't seen that yet but as I said at the beginning we're getting to the stage now where sunspots are likely to to rise up in latitude a little bit higher. So are we going to see high latitude sunspots? Well this happened last weekend. You might have seen it yourselves on uh, space weather. It wasn't a sunspot, it was just plage but um, it, it could well have, uh, it was quite a near thing, apparently. It was quite strong and a sunspot could have formed. Sadly, it didn't. Um, but the interesting thing is it was at north 60. So that's really high. I mean, you're only going to get a handful of sunspots ever appear that. I don't think I've ever witnessed one quite, quite that high. So that's certainly something I'm going to ask you to look out for. We're at that sort of really interesting time, this next sort of 12 to 18 months. So observations are, are really requested, please, for high latitude sunspots. Uh, um, or even the, if you spot some plage or any, anything at all really at high latitude, please let me know straight away. Um, well, this course being astronomy, I did say there was two recent studies. There's a second study into the uh, north-south asymmetry of sunspots, uh, and they reckon that uh, they've been very close indeed. There's not been much difference between northern and hemisphere uh, sunspots numbers anyway. And because of that, they have come to conclude that this cycle will be even weaker than cycle 24, and it will be 25% to 40% weaker. So we can either have one of the strongest solar cycles on record coming up or one of the weakest. So I think that's just typically astronomy, isn't it? So what's it going to look like? Well, in the words of Sir Patrick, we simply don't know. Um, and, and that's really when the solar section is at its strength, because it's not our job to pontificate or to forecast, it's to observe and to record and to find out. And I'm sure that's what you'll be doing as I will over the next few years. Thank you very much. Um, and now I'll hand you back and over to, to Peter. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, Peter, are you okay with um, unmuting yourself and turning your camera on? If not, I'll try yes, un yes, unmuting I, you. I've unmuted uh, myself. Great. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. And do you want to have your camera on or you, you prefer? Uh, yes, we can, if you wish. Yes. Um, I don't think I'm just having a look to see if I've got. I don't think I've got the ability to turn your camera on from here. I think I can only turn um, cameras off. I, I, I've got a message to say you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Ah, let me just see what I can. So. Let me try that, see if that does allow us. Ah, great. Yes, that's working. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, 
Th thanks, Lynn. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now and turn off my camera. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so thanks very much, Lynn. And so, um, so this talk is um, about the um, Carrington event Sunspark Group. Um, I'm sure most uh, astronomers, whether they're solar or, or non-solar uh, specialists, have heard of the Carrington event. Um, but the, as I say, this talk is really about the Sunspark Group associated with that event rather than the event itself, even though I will be touching on it um, as we go through. So, yeah, so just briefly, uh, the Carrington event um, was um, a solar flare, probably the first solar flare that's, that was observed uh, back on uh, the 1st of September in 1859, about 100, just over 160 years ago, by Richard Carrington and uh, Richard uh, Hodgson. And the, the drawing on the top right uh, is of the Sunspot group on that day. And the uh, white areas, uh, A would A and B, are the location of the, the, the flare that was, was seen um, in these two places. And the locations C and D are where the flare ended. Um, so the flare only lasted about five minutes. Um, but almost straight away, uh, there were magnetic disturbances um, noted. So the plot on the bottom right shows the magnetic um, horizontal components on the top and the declination on the bottom from Greenwich. And these two um, notches on the bottom in the middle and at the right, at the top right, um, the timings of those are exactly the same as the um, the flare, time of the flare. The two plots are displaced horizontally by 12 hours, which is why they don't appear above each other. Uh, and extensive aurora were seen, uh, both in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Um, but interestingly, uh, which I didn't realize before looking into this, is that those aurora were seen several days before the, this flare was observed. So going from the, the 28th, 29th of August uh, through to a couple of days after this event. So obviously to get uh, Aurora before the 1st of September, um, this region, uh, presumably this region, uh, was uh, producing flares um, as well before, before being observed on the 1st. So the, the drawing, um, was made, as I say, was made by Richard Carrington uh, using the projection method. Um, and so when you observe the sun via projection, uh, east is on the right and west is on the left. For the, apart from this drawing, uh, for the rest of the presentation, I'm using the same convention that uh, Lynn was using, where we use the naked eye view of the sun, so east is on the left and west is on the, re on, on the right. So um, before we have a look at the various observations that were made as, at this man this time, I've got a brief introduction of the, uh, the astronomers we're going to be talking about uh, and um, one observatory. So Richard Carrington, I'm sure most of you have, have, heard, have heard of Richard Carrington. So he used um, a four and a half inch F11 refractor and that produced a um, 11 inch projected disc inside his observatory. So from his observations over a period of um, almost 10 years, he managed to determine the position of the sun's rotation axis. He determined that the latitude of sunspots varied over the sunspot cycle. And he also determined uh, that the sun isn't a solid body and that there's um, differential rotation um, of the sun, so the rotation period varies depending on whether you're on the equator or towards the poles. Uh, he published um, a book, um, which you, you can find online. Um, so and that gives a huge amount of information. Um, so it um, gives all his analysis uh, and also with some of his drawings as well. And of course, we, we still uh, re remember Richard Carrington uh, every day that we observe the sun in the sense that the longitudes that we measure 
um, are with reference to his fixed rotation period. And we also have um, each rotation is numbered, and that's the uh, Carrington rotation number. So the flare itself was uh, seen independently uh, by Richard Hodgson in, in Highgate. Um, he, he used a, a six inch equatorial refractor. Um, there are also observations from this period uh, from Father Angelo Secchi um, in Italy, in Rome in Italy. Um, so he was um, probably more well known for spectroscopy uh, than the solar observations, but um, nevertheless, he, he made um, drawings um, and he, his telescope um, produced a, a, a disk diameter of around uh, 10 inches. And he's one of the first scientists to, to indicate that the, the sun is, is the same as a, a star. Uh, the next set of observations uh, were from Henrik Schwab in Germany. So, so he observed for um, over 50 years, uh, almost 50 years, um, extensively. And in 1859, he made 263 observations. So he must have had uh, some pretty good weather conditions uh, in Germany. Um, so he used a variety of telescopes uh, but the main one he used for a long period of time uh, was a Fraunhofer telescope uh, with a, a three and a half foot focal length. And most of his drawings are, are four and a half inches in diameter. However, unlike um, previous astronomers, he was observing the sun using filters and a direct view uh, rather than a projection. And he's credited with um, discovering the solar cycle, the roughly 11 year cycle um, of the change in the number of sunspots. Uh, and he discovered that in 1844. Uh, the one observatory that I'm going to mention is Kew Observatory, uh, just outside London. And they uh, developed uh, a solar telescope for taking photographs and the image on the right shows the uh, equipment that they used. Uh, that was commissioned in 1854, so just a few uh, years before the Carrington event. And, and then it was um, transferred to the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Um, and now it's in the Science Museum in London. Um, at the end, I'll show uh, a, a reference to a book that uh, Lee MacDonald has written on, on Q. So, um, so if you want to find out more about Q, that's a very good uh, book to have a look at. And the final um, astronomer that we're going to um, show some observations of is uh, Reverend Frederick Howlett, who um, was a solar observer for 35 years uh, based in, in Alton in, in Hampshire. And he used uh, a three inch refracting telescope, so a fairly common type telescope that a lot of uh, solar observers still use today. But it was interesting to note that um, he had a projection um, diameter of 32 inches, which is uh, quite large and um, quite unusual. Um, but I'll talk more about that when we come to his observations uh, later on. So um, both Richard Carrington and Richard Hudson produced a um, report in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, and they're both consecutive reports in, in, in that um, journal. So, so this is Richard Carrington's uh, report, obviously showing his drawing. Well, I've picked out a few um, of his, his words from his report. Uh, so the first one, he, he said that he, he witnessed an event which he believed was exceedingly rare, which even today, uh, observing a white light flare is, is, still, is still rare. And um, so he observed, as I mentioned earlier, uh, two patches of bright light uh, in A and B. Uh, and the brightness uh, increased. Um, he then went out of the observatory uh, to find someone else to confirm what he'd been seeing. And he returned 60 seconds later, just a minute later, 
and it, he noted that it had changed considerably and was much feeble and was in position C and D. But interestingly, uh, he also noted that um, he felt that the phenomenon that he just observed was at an elevation considerably above the general surface of the sun. So implying that so he thought it was above the photosphere. And of course, we, we now know that uh, flares occur in the chromosphere, which is uh, the thin layer above the photosphere that we observe with hydrogen alpha telescopes. And um, it is in hydrogen alpha that we observe solar flares. So in that sense, he, his uh, inclination turned out to be uh, correct. And um, on the left here, we've got uh, his drawing from the 1st of September. Um, so um, this is with uh, east, as I say, east on the left, uh, west on the right, north at the top and south at the bottom. Um, so the group here, um, is the one that uh, is responsible for the flare. As you can see, it's um, just past the central meridian, which would be the line here. And there's a few other smaller um, groups. And so, so the, the date of the uh, 1st of September was roughly at the, the peak of the um, Sontobot cycle at that time. So it's, now, it's obviously it's possible to take the drawing and then to uh, clean it up. Um, which is what, what I've done on the, on the right hand side. And I've also changed the, the axis so that the rotation axis um, is, is vertical rather than being, being uh, at an angle. Um, if we look at this page here, so um, he, in his book, as I mentioned, he um, recorded um, the various groups on particular days. So this is the, the one that we were looking at on the 1st of September. Um, but he, you can show here for group um, 520 um, on the 28th, you can see, and uh, on the 25th, it was actually quite close to the limb. But you can see that it's quite an elongated uh, group in the, in the north-south direction. Um, most, most groups are, are elongated east-west rather than north-south. Uh, but you can also see from here that there was quite a change between the 28th and the 1st in the 10th, in the sense that by the 1st, the group had uh, split up into various components. Um, he also um, linked this group here with this one, so that he referred to both of these uh, as group 520. Um, now, if we were classifying uh, this group, we would say that this is actually two groups. We've got a single a single spot uh, to the north, um, and, and then we've got the main group below. He also, um, in his observatory, he times uh, the passage of each sunspot group um, using a um, crosshairs type system, and he was able to um, for each um, sunspot he was able to determine the position with respect to the center of the sun. It's, it's angle and the um, lat long uh, as well. And this table is, is I say he's group 520 and then the first um, 28th and the first. So, so this table is quite useful to compare um, his positions he's derived uh, with his drawing as I'll show later on. He also produced um, synoptic uh, drawings of each rotation. So he must have uh, taken uh, each group um, and for the drawing nearest when the group was at the, the central meridian, um, he, he, then, he then drew the, the spot. So we've got Northern hemisphere, the Southern hemisphere, and then we've got um, 180 degrees of longitude. Uh, for each rotation, there was a, there is a, second drawing like this, but obviously for angles between 180 degrees and 360 degrees. Uh, this is um, his um, synoptic drawing for two rotations before uh, the, uh, the Carrington event date. And you can see that the group um, appeared uh, as a collection of uh, small spots 
Uh, and if we go to the next rotation, you can see it, is, it had developed quite extensively. Uh, again, there's quite a north-south component as well as an east-west component. So it's a very complicated sunspot group. And then obviously we've got the, the group on the, on the 1st of September. But there wasn't um, anything much seen. There may be one very small sunspot on the next rotation, but it had, so it had decayed quite substantially uh, from its appearance on the first to the next rotation. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, Richard Hudson also observed it um, independently, and uh, in his report in, in the month notices, um, he likened it to um, a very brilliant star of light and comparable in brilliance to Alpha Levi, Vega. So he observed it for the full duration of around five minutes and uh, then noticed it uh, disappeared at around 11.25 a.m. So the timing is, is virtually the same as Richard Carrington. But he also notes uh, that the uh, magnetic instruments at Q also um, simultaneously notice a great uh, disturbance. These, his report also mentions uh, at the bottom, you might better should be able to see that um, he had a diagram which he showed one of the meetings of the RIS. Uh, it'd be interested to know if that drawing still exists. Okay, so moving on to um, Father Secchi. So I've got three drawings um, that uh, he produced um, on the 20th, the first one being on the 28th of August. So a few days before the, the flare. Um, so the group was, was in the Eastern hemisphere. Um, as you can see here, he's, he's drawn a slight enlargement uh, on, on the actual drawing itself. And um, I, I've just um, superimposed a, a, an enlarged drawing. Um, so you can see that uh, he's numbered uh, this group, um, one number here, and then he's numbered this group here. He's, he's identified this group, this sunspot as a different group. What you can also see in his drawings, uh, I don't have an explanation for this, there's a little hand appearing, pointing to presumably something of interest, um, but he's not pointing to this, uh, this large group. And if we compare it with Carrington's drawing uh, from the, the same day, um, you, can, you can see some resemblance in not exactly matching. Um, Carrington seems to have two sunspots um, here, whereas there seems to be one here. Uh, but the general outline is, is very similar. And this is for the 31st. Um, again, I've done enlargement. You can see uh, it's uh, the, the group has split up, has um, changed shape quite a lot from the previous day. And then on the fifth, so a few days after the uh, counting event, with the group uh, near the western uh, limb, you can see that it appears to have broken up into lots of smaller um, umbra, and maybe there's a hint of a penumbra with an area of extensive area of faculty um, around the uh, sunspot group. And again, his, uh, his hand has appeared um, on a different group. Uh, yeah, so uh, I mentioned Q uh, Observatory. So here are two photographs uh, this time uh, on the 31st and the 3rd. So uh, the, on the bottom here, there's an enlargement uh, on the, from the 31st. The, the drawing, the, the photographs themselves uh, are probably not as detailed as a drawing would be, but obviously we're talking about photography 160 odd years ago, and not as, as advanced as, as now. Uh, and if we compare uh, the 31st with the Carrington's drawing on the 1st, the day after, you can see the same sort of structures uh, um, in, in both the, the, the photograph and Carrington's drawing. And then um, Henrik Swab. So he's uh, there are two um, drawings. Um, 
So on the 27th of August, uh, it's obviously the, the group is, is over in the, on the east. And uh, again, he has uh, identified these as these groups, these sunspots as two different groups, the main group and then the smaller sunspots further to the north and the west. And on the on the first, he observed on the first as well. Um, again, we've got the the main group here, and he's done a more detailed uh, drawing. Um, and I've just superimposed here um, Carrington's drawing for the same same day. Um, it's perhaps a little bit difficult to match Carrington's drawing with uh, Swab's drawing. Um, except you can probably identify uh, the, the, the loop in the middle is perhaps this loop here in the middle of Swab's drawing. Uh, maybe these ombre at the top here are part of this ombre on Carrington's drawing. But he seems to have drawn some penumbra um, between the, the main Carrington spot and the, the, fo the, uh, the following spots uh, as here. But the thing to remember is, as I said, with, with Swab, he was, um, his drawing is made from a direct view rather than from um, projection, which in my view is probably a more difficult task to do, especially in terms of the, the location, exact location of the sunspots. Um, so on Carrington's drawing, we've got a Southern Hemisphere group and we've got that in Swab's drawing as well. Now, um, I don't have access to any other of Swab's um, drawings, even though they, they do exist and the Royal Astronomical Society have his uh, observing books. But um, his drawings have been digitized in terms of the position of the ombre. Uh, so you can also get access to that data and you can plot it. So uh, we've got latitude going from top to right and then we've got the central meridian distance in the horizontal axis which is just the angle from the uh, central meridian either um, east or west and so the blue spots are, are swabs uh, ombre positions and from um, Carrington's tables I've, I've superimposed in green uh, his um, positions of his sunspots and you can see that there's um, a good correspondence um, bet between the two. Uh, and so that the, the group is, is obviously to the left on the 25th, uh, progressing towards the central meridian on the 28th, uh, and then past the central meridian, or just past the central meridian on, on the 1st. And if we look in a bit more detail around the area of the uh, Carrington's group, um, you can see um, the, the red cross indicates the, the position of uh, Swab's um, group uh, here. And in purple, we've got the other group that he identified, group uh, 142. And we've got the mean position of Carrington's group, which encompasses uh, all three of those uh, green, green dots. So if you were just looking at um, Carrington's that long position for the group, it will be further north than uh, Swab produced. And the same for the, the other drawing. So by the first, there was just a, a single northern um, group, a sunspot. Um, so, but um, Swab observed um, almost every day during this period. And um, so we can, we can use the, the, the size of his group as determined by the extent in longitude and latitude to see uh, how things change with time. So once we've got our drawings in a form that's um, nice, and, nice and cleaned up, as I, I showed earlier, uh, I can use uh, my software to um, analyze the, uh, the group in terms of the position, that long, the, the size of it, uh, and also on the right hand side, the, the air of it. Uh, how large the group is. Um, so on the left-hand plot, I've superimposed Carrington's um, positions from his tables onto his drawing. 
and you can see that the, uh, the positions tie up extremely well with his drawings. Um, you must remember that to, to calculate the, the lat long of a sunspot 160 years ago was quite a, a labor intensive uh, activity. Uh, now it's just a matter of clicking a, a mouse. Um, so as I say, we can, we can use the software to, to uh, measure the position, extent and the area uh, of this group and the other drawings. And so uh, I've done that, and uh, this plot here shows the results in terms of um, the longitude range of, of the Carrington group uh, as a function of uh, date. So this is the day of year, um, January the 1st being day one. So, so time increases from the top to bottom. You know, we've got the longitude uh, west to east. Um, so in green, we've got uh, Swab's um, measurements from his data. Uh, in, in purple, we've got uh, Seki, his, his uh, measurements from his drawings, Q from the drawings, and then in red is the counting drawing. So there's a couple of things to note in that um, Swab's longitude measurements um, tend to, to vary slightly from day to day. Uh, and they're perhaps a, a little bit longer than uh, some of the other observers. Uh, but again, that could be because he's doing a direct uh, drawing rather than a, a sketching the sun's uh, disk on, on, by a projection. Um, and you can also note that um, from the Q drawings, they tend to be uh, a bit shorter. Again, that's probably because of the, uh, the photographic process not being um, as well defined uh, 160 years ago as the drawings would have been at that time. But the main thing is there isn't a huge amount of uh, drift as the sun progressed, uh, as the sun's bike progressed from, from east to, to west. But we can also look at the latitude and uh, we can see here, uh, so we've got the, the mean position uh, at, the, at the location of the, uh, the dots, uh, and then we've got the extent um, shown by the, um, the bars. And we've got the various observers as in the previous diagram. Uh, and then at the bottom here, we've got uh, one of the other groups, uh, one of the Southern Hemisphere groups, just as a uh, reference uh, for each of the days. But what you can see um, is that generally before about the, um, so the 1st of September is day zero, the red dot. Um, so, so minus two will be the, th the 30th. You can see between the 30th and the 31st, there seems to be a change in the latitude of the group uh, by a few degrees, uh, which is uh, quite unusual. Um, is probably an indicator of um, a, a quite a big change um, in, the, in the appearance of the group between the 30th and, and the 31st and the 1st. So in terms of the size, um, from the 1st of September drawing, you get an area of just over 3,000 millionths of the sun's visible hemisphere, uh, which if we look at the catalog of um, sunspot area since 1874 is the 24th largest. So um, a fairly respectable, uh, respectably large group, but um, not the largest and about half the size of the largest recorded group um, which was in uh, March, April, 1947. So I've got one more observer, um, observations to show you. And this is uh, Frederick Cowlitz. So if you remember, he, he uh, observed uh, with a fairly modest telescope, a three inch refractor and used a 32 inch diameter disc, um, which uh, I hope he had a, a, a good Mount because obviously trying to um, position a 32 inch diameter disc in an observatory is going to be quite difficult. Um, but so he he showed, uh, as I mentioned before, that at the beginning um, the the group was quite elongated north south, as you can see here. Uh, even by the 29th, uh, it was still 
primarily in the north-south direction rather than east-west. And on the 30th, the bottom um, left here. Um, again, we've got quite a, a very complicated group. Um, but then by the 1st, uh, you can see that um, it's changed cons considerably. Uh, so there's been a lot of activity between the, the 30th and the 1st. Um, but you can also see um, from the 1st to the 3rd, it seems to indicate a, a change in latitude. Um, at, at, at first, I wasn't quite sure whether this was a, a real effect uh, or not, um, but it seems to sort of um, confirm the, the other measurements that there was a change, change between the, the 30th and the 1st uh, and subsequent days in the latitude of the group. Um, but the main thing is, as I say, this group must have, you know, was really complicated magnetically. And, and obviously that um, indicates a, a type of group that would produce a lot of flares and, and hence uh, northern lights. And he even, he even notes here an intense magnetic storm on the 28th. So just to, just to finish off, um, so I have hopefully um, you've learned a bit more about the, the sunspots associated with the Kangson event. Uh, most of the information that I've shown was available uh, on the internet. Uh, the only um, observation that I wasn't on the internet was the last one I showed from, from Harriet, and that was in a, a book by Sir Robert Ball, The Story of the Sun, um, which, is, which itself is over 100 years old now. So the, the group itself was uh, complex in nature, as I've shown. Uh, we would, we would classify it now as an FKC type group. And it's those type of groups that produce the most activity in uh, hydrogen alpha. And it, it was at least initially extended in latitude. So um, based on, particularly on Swab's measurements, uh, there was a suggestion of a change in the group's latitude uh, between the 30th and the 31st. And uh, Techies and, and how its drawings seem to confirm that. I've also shown that it's uh, decayed significantly by the time it uh, reached the, uh, the Western Limb, um, and that it was a, a reasonably large group, just over 3,000 millionths in size, and that it was seen on previous two rotations, uh, but only a very small sunspot was shown on the next rotation. So, i uh, got a couple of slides of uh, references. Um, if I was to point out one reference, if you wanted to find out more about the, um, the group and uh, its magnetic uh, and overall impact, I would suggest having a look at the third paper. It's available uh, free online. Um, as I mentioned, um, Carrington's book itself is a, is, has been scanned and is available on uh, Google, Google, Google Books. Um, and this is uh, the, also the um, two reports from Camerton and Hodgson are uh, available free online as well from um, the RIS. And they're, they're interesting to, to read as well. Um, so yeah, just to finish, um, as I mentioned, Lee MacDonald has uh, written a, an extensive uh, history of Q Observatory, um, not just in terms of uh, um, the magnetic um, observations, but uh, of, of Q itself, and also uh, extending to uh, his, sort of history of science from that uh, period. On the left, uh, there's also a book that came out a few years ago by Stuart Clark um, called The Sun Kings, which also gives uh, a, a readable accounts of Carrington, his life and um, his observations. So at that point I will, uh, I will stop. And over to you, Andy. Thank you, Peter. And Kevin, I'll just make sure I can, um, I think you should be able to unmute and 
start your video yourself. Otherwise, I'll just. Yeah, I'm getting a message that you you've stopped the okay. video. Yeah, now it's letting me start again. There you go. Oh yeah. Right, where's my presentation gone to? Uh, can you see that? I can't open it up no. full so screen. At the moment, um, we're not having any video and we're not having any of your presentation. You might want to try minimizing Zoom for a moment. And then, are you seeing your presentation on your screen? I am, but not as a full presentation. Do you mean not as a full screen? Is not it? as a full screen. Yeah. If you, that, that shouldn't matter. If you go, um, back to Zoom. So Zoom you should see as a sort of little icon down the bottom of your screen. If you click that to make it active and then do share screen. Just bear with me. Share screen, yeah. And then try the presentation. And click share, presumably. Yeah. Okay. Now that's, I think things are going to start happening. And there's a couple more bits to do. I think if you, um, do you want to turn your camera on, which would now be in the top of the screen? Yep. There we go. And then finally, if you go to the presentation and do the start presentation in PowerPoint, that should automatically bring it, I think, to full screen. Yeah, sorry about this, guys. These things happen. Are, are you finding um, the PowerPoint isn't responding by any chance? Or, ah, there we go. That's starting nearly. What it might be is you might be in Zoom. Oh, no, I think that's now starting, is it? Let's. To see if it... Can you see anything now? Ah, there we go. Yeah, that's that's now to full presentation mode. Right, you got that? Yeah, that okay. That's all looking good. We're there. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, right. Yeah, thanks for your help. Uh, right, this uh, this is the third time I've given this talk to the BA. The first time was about four years ago down at Burlington House. And then uh, two years ago, the meeting that we had at Govana, uh, I, I gave this talk about bipolar magnetic regions. Uh, it's a subject which I came across quite accidentally, um, for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. But it's something that, that anybody can observe using hydrogen alpha telescopes. Uh, I'm showing this first picture because the uh, Kansel Hoy Observatory is one of the uh, best in Europe for presenting the sun on a regular daily basis weather permitting uh, sometimes the weather is better here in the uk than it is in the austria but uh, i use this as a sort of a reference point for the observations that i've been making for about 10 years um, that image was taken on uh, uh, the september the 28th 2017 and the same day this is the image I got with um, with my small uh, Lunt telescope, 60mm Lunt and the Canon 550D uh, DSLR showing exactly the same regions but in slightly different method of presentation. I always use grayscale for imaging these bipolar magnetic regions. To observe in red light or hydrogen alpha light is, uh, is overpowering the red so grayscaling allows more in information to be perceived by the camera and also when i'm processing you can see there that these 
features are very very large I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later on this is on wavelength on center wavelength of hydrogen alpha and it shows the usual uh, detail sunspots dark filaments and a background mottling of the the chromosphere and of course the uh, the, the prominence is on the limb I always refer to the uh, images on the magnetograms produced by the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Again, visible, the, the observable on a, a daily basis online. And you can see from those two images, that one that I took with a little telescope and the SDO magnetogram, that we're, we're talking about the same objects. These are big features on the surface of the sun, which until comparatively recently appear to have gone unnoticed slightly better view the same day uh, but with the lunt not for not tuned on band but tuned to the right red side of center wavelength and i think you'll agree that it shows these magnetic regions far more clearly let's just go back to those and that on band not a great deal to observe move it red side of center wavelength and these features really start to stand out now i haven't quite sussed out exactly what, where we are looking within the chromosphere i suspect that red band or center red side of center wavelength is actually looking deeper into the chromosphere so whereas on band is showing features fairly high up in the chromosphere and not much about the magnetic regions tuning it red side is showing less in the way of the dark filaments but more in the way of the magnet magnetic features these are the bipolar magnetic regions but let's go back a little bit further they exactly match solar magnetic structures associated with white light sunspots but they can occur on their own without spot activity and as you'll see later i've been observing these for quite a long time and in the past six months or so that uh, that lynn talked about although we've had a few white light uh, sunspots the actual magnetic activity hasn't been that great uh for reasons that i i don't really party to i don't understand it but let me go back even further to the 1970s it took me a long time to actually find out what it was i was observing i call them chromospheric bruises because they look like dusky patches on the surface of the sun in hydrogen alpha and i couldn't find any reference to this to these at all in the baa and precious little in the professional um, archives but it was only when I reread this book by Ian Nicholson, The Sun, published in the 1970s, that it suddenly dawned on me what it was I was observing. Here we've got the sun in hydrogen alpha, but on band, uh, center wavelength, which is this one. But as we move the tuning to the red side of center wavelength, here and especially there we're seeing more of these dark features they correspond pretty good pretty well with the calcium k observations that a lot of people are observing in nowadays but i point out that these are 1970s skylab images taken with the state-of-the-art um, instruments on that satellite believe it or not we can actually do as well if not better nowadays using uh, small telescopes either the coronado pst or the 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 smaller lunts and either of these telescopes can image bmrs better than skylab did believe it or not if we look at the the right hand at uh, the left hand side this is the uh, an image taken with the the lunt on band on that center wavelength and if we move that tuning towards the red side of the center wavelength we start to see these dark features begin to become more prominent now that's with the the lunt 
I don't know how far red side I'm tuned. Uh, I just sort of screw down the pressure tuner and hope for the best. I'll explain how I do it in a minute. But similarly with the Coronado, we're seeing essentially the same thing with the 40 millimeter Coronado telescope as we can with a 60 millimeter Lunt. And both of those are better than taken in the 1970s from Skylab. This is the uh, Coronado that I, I found out only last week. I bought it in 2006. So it costs a princely sum of £200. I think they're about three times that price, maybe four times that price now. Um, I couldn't find out exactly where the telescope was tuned. So from an early to early days, I put on that sticker and used that to visually and photographically tune the telescope so that I was getting maximum detail uh, on, on the surface of the sun. By selecting an optimal tuning uh, against that stuck on scale, I was able to show that the bipolar magnetic regions could be seen better if I tuned it slightly red side. Now, because I don't know which way around these uh, telescopes tune, all I can say is that red side, as far as I'm concerned, is when the tuning is turned that way. So you see that there's the optimum on band and there's the optimum off band for these bipolar magnetic regions now because i'm not technical as you might have gathered i haven't changed it since night uh, since 2012 i've only refocused it about three times in the past seven or eight years uh, but it means that this telescope is always available on its little uh, mounting here in the study, I can pick it up with one hand, whiz it outside, and I can take photographs of the sun, weather permitting, even with very, very small gaps in the cloud. So I'm, I'm trying to observe as often as I possibly can now that I'm retired, and I'm, I'm averaging probably about 100, maybe 150 observations a year. Again, it comes down to the weather. So having got these images, I'm taking... Uh, both uh, JPEG and RAW images. And those of you with the uh, with the Coronado will know that it's got a, a, a sweet spot. Uh, so if we look at the basic image, you find that the center of the disc is grossly overexposed. But if you look at the uh, RAW image and using Adobe Camera Raw, adjust the brightness of that image, it's possible to get more controllable uh, features visible like this in the center I then get rid of that red so I can't see these images when we're on center wavelength and using um, hydrogen alpha it's too red but by using monochrome and selectively using gradient filters in, in Photoshop CS5 I can increase the contrast to start to bring out these surface details. I don't know if you can see it or not, but when I took this particular picture, which was about two months ago, there was in fact a small area of flare in the Southern Hemisphere there, just about there. This was taken earlier this week. Uh, not a lot to see at the moment. But they can see the, the dark filament and the background mottling. Uh, there's very little in the way of magnetic activity. Um, you can see the limb detail, the prominences and what have you, but not much in the way of magnetic detail. How do I go about using the, uh, the, the Lunt? Well, I take a whole series of images. Typically with the, the PST, I, I take 40 or 50 images and pick the best um, using the, the, the JPEGs to select. With the LUNT, I take a series, series of images five at a time and increase the pressure on the tuner to move it more and more red side. And then I've got a series of pictures 
where we've got more or less on band imaging and then successively further and further red side again picked out purely by trial and error let's go back to absolute basics basic sunspot theory now this, this comes about in the 1950s by the uh, Harold and uh, Horace Babcock father and son team working at Mount Wilson Palomar observatories they come up with came up with this idea that the sunspots were caused by a wind up in the sun's magnetic field from the start of the cycle up to about three years after the beginning of the cycle and that's as Lynn says is roughly where we are now we're about three years after the start of cycle 25 so now is a good time to look for these bipolar magnetic regions we start off with a, a, a north to south poloidal um, magnetic uh, field lines as the sun rotates they get increasingly wound up so that after about two, two or three years rotation the magnetic fields field strength is increasing and eventually it starts to break through the the chromosphere and it's at the base of these stitches or the these magnetic loops where we get the, the uh, bipolar magnetic regions there we've got two magnetic regions uh, following and the preceding one different polarities and in the opposite hemisphere exactly the reverse magnetic wise this is roughly where we're at at the moment so these are areas of opposing magnetic polarity at the breakthrough points the roots of magnetic loops or stitches and you can imagine if we look at the the magnetogram there you can see the different polarity uh, i can never remember which way around it is but i think the yellow uh, image is uh, magnetic fields coming out of the sun they loop round and go back down in to form this so-called stitch and it's within those bipolar magnetic regions that you get sunspots formed so this was taken uh, in um, 2016 you can see the sunspot that's that one in uh, region 2477 and down here you can see the magnetic regions fairly clearly um, this one's uh, in 2476 that one is in a region which is not numbered so it's, a, it's an active region but it, it's not a numbered active region so going on from that we can successively photograph the the solar image uh, as the as the cycle continues uh, both with the pst and with the the lunt and comparing that with the white light image tank with an 80 millimeter refractor you can see that these are in are very very, very large uh, regions indeed as the cycle progresses these magnetic regions get bigger um, and they also tend to fade so you can see that these regions down in the southern hemisphere there although they're visible they've got no sunspots in them uh, the magnetic regions have weakened and they've become faded whereas in the northern hemisphere we've got these well two two there two magnetic regions there this large one in the middle very large one in the middle and then this more uh, uh, diffuse one over on the eastern hemisphere um, you can see from this that when you get prominences or dark filaments they tend to line up with the neutral zone between the areas of opposite magnetic uh, activity this is something that we see from time to uh, time to time you see this uh, magnetic region in uh, active region 2485 uh, you can see the line clearly between the two opposing polarities and it's exactly along that line where you get that filament and of course that's 
uh, that you're also going to get um, prominence activity along that line as well when it reaches the limb. Another thing that you will see as well is that, that dark filaments not only line up against the, the uh, oppos uh, opposing magnetic fields but you also see them at the edges of the magnetic fields so you can see that these dark filaments here are surrounding the northern and the preceding edge of that uh, bipolar magnetic region quite clearly. Right, I've been observing the sun now on a regular basis for about nine years. Uh, so cycle 24 was the first one that I, ob uh, I observed completely, uh, both in hydrogen and alpha and in, uh, in white light. Um, Babcock describes a lot of different types of uh, phenomena on the surface of the sun. And I won't go into detail now, but I've been observing uh, since 2015 um, with, with the, the Lunt and um, I'm beginning to appreciate the, the detail that these small telescopes can in fact show. Not, not just white light images of sunspots, but these underlying far, far bigger uh, magnetic regions. BMRs are by far the largest structures observable on the, the disk. Um, I was trying to work out the size of these, but uh, they certainly exceed half a billion square kilometers. So if you can observe these things on a regular basis, uh, and it's not too difficult as uh, I hope I've shown, uh, we're seeing things which were not described in the BA solar section until comparatively recently. Admittedly, we didn't have the telescopes to do it, but what I would suggest is that not only do we use the telescopes as, as prescribed on band, but also move them slightly red side or centre wavelength to show structures that, that normally haven't, haven't been observed until comparatively recently. I noticed in one of the images that Lynn showed uh, by Sherry Lynn Carl, uh, she took an excellent photograph of a, a bipolar magnetic region uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, she was on the the team that presented at, um, at Govan a couple of years back. One thing that uh, I'm interested in uh, is that BMRs can persist for more than one solar rotation with or without spot activity. Now, going back to 2017, at the end of cycle 24, these were over a period of uh, three rotations, uh, rotation 21, 93, 94 and 95, over a period of about um, two, two months. And you can see that the same things are coming around month after month. These happen to have sunspots. If we look very recently, uh, since the last uh, uh, cycle became or started to come to an end, we go back to rotation 2233 uh, and 2234 in August and September 2020. You see that these features in the northern hemisphere persisted between August and September. The same things are changing. Uh, some of them had some spots, like this one had a sunspot in it. These others didn't, but nevertheless, they are visible. You can just about see them there. And similarly, you can see them here. See that one in particular, uh, compared with that. And they continued for another rotation. This is rotation 2235. 2236 uh, September October uh, 2020 and these are coming around again for the third time so these are very long-lived features the, the last two to three months with or without sunspots and then they ultimately fade um, I should point out that these parallel lines are actually interference within the optical systems either these are not on the surface and so on. so what I would ask is that, that anybody who's interested in observing these things 
please do so. Tune red side of centre wavelength with the hydrogen alpha telescopes. And uh, they do justify more attention by amateur solar observers. Um, and I hope you get involved. Uh, this is the one that I showed earlier. You can see them anytime now. As the cycle 25 increases, you'll see these things getting bigger and better uh, until eventually after about the next eight to nine years, they start to fade again. So thank you for that. I'm going to add uh, a couple of references. Um, as I said, very little is actually written about in amateur literature regarding these magnetic uh, structures. Um, and these papers go back to the 1950s by the Babcocks at Mount Wilson uh, Observatories. Uh, the topography, topology of the sun's magnetic field uh, is available online. Both of these are available online. The Quiet Sun, which was a, a NASA technical report is worth getting if you can find it uh, I bought one many years ago and especially if you go back to the 1970s these two uh, Australian um, solar physicists RJ Bray and RE Lockhead wrote a series of books on the chromosphere and also sunspots and uh, well worth getting if you can find them I bought them reasonably priced off Amazon about three or four years ago uh, the only thing that's been written uh, recently for the BA was back in 2017 when I wrote a short paper. I promised Lynn that I'll write another one as the activity increases. Uh, so hopefully um, stay tuned and uh, you'll see something in writing in the not too distant future. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kevin. And thank Thanks to all the uh, speakers for fascinating talks. Um, Lynn, I think is it now that we uh, want to start the Q&A? So I yep. think if everyone is able to re-enable. Yeah. Just at the start, I'd like to invite Roger Sunworth just to give a very short presentation, only about five ah. minutes, about his bubble prominences, and then we can go straight into the Q&A session. So I'm going to log out and log back in again so I can- Okay, proceed. if I just for a minute, it was- uh, mm. Just to, Roger Samworth, yes. I'll, okay. Roger, I'm just about to promote you onto the, uh, the as a panelist, so I think you'll get a message coming up. Ah, great, I can see Roger's joining us now. Hello, Roger. Okay, can you see me and hear me? Yes, hear oh, you fine now. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, I've got a, just got a few slides on these strange phenomena that um, that Lynn mentioned. Uh, there's only a half, a, well, three or four of these slides. So if I Great. just share my screen. Yeah, and you, um, you good with doing that? I'm, I think so. I've, I'm, if I'm, if it, there it is. Okay, have you got it? No. Um, I can see the the top of the PowerPoint. I think if you go to presentation mode, then it will put it into sort of the um, the full screen. For okay, you. there we go. Great. Yeah, that's working. Okay, good. Um, yeah, the, these these are just something I've named transient polar bubble prominences, um, and I, I came across these purely by accident, um, and I still still see them purely by accident, um, but. Nevertheless, they're interesting. You'll see why in a minute. Um, going back to what um, Kevin was talking about, about his PST, um, being able to rapidly take pictures. Well, this one is, is my setup. And there, there's a Lunt 35mm tilt tune telescope on, on a windowsill indoors. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's there, it lives there, unless we've got guests. And um, it, it's ever ready for taking pictures uh, through the window. I don't 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 even go outside. Um, it's on a little uh, tabletop EQ1 mount. It's got a breast and microcular full HD camera on it, a 50 quid camera. It's always ready. I usually acquire about 400 frame AVIs in sharp cap, stack it in Registax, process it in GIMP, and the image quality I get from that 
is is broadly comparable to the gong images, um, which is probably not surprising because the the gong apertures are twenty eight mil, and my little lump there is thirty five mil. But but generally speaking, they're they're they're, they're broadly comparable, and and up here. You can see a gong image from uh, Chero Tololo, in fact, and uh, there's uh, uh, the, my Lunt image of, at, the, at the same time. Uh, contrasts are a bit different and so on. Uh, that's a colorized one that I generally do, and there's an animation of a, a prominence, but th that's just the setup. Um, the the Amarillis is, is optional, in fact. Um, so this is, the, this is the first one of these I spotted, and this was uh, two years ago. And it's, it's a, a bubble shape and it's as a high latitude and it's very transient. It only lasts a few minutes. Um, I was puzzled when I first saw this. And uh, in fact, I, I introduced myself to, to Lynn about this. And this is this, this whole thing inspired me to join the BAA, in fact. <laughs> so um, Lynn said it looked like a very much a post flare loop. Um, I, I did actually it was published in the Sky at Night magazine as well, and they sort of said the same thing. Um, but that, that was the, the first one, and they're, they're very transient, but they are very high latitudes. Um, just to show how transient they are, this is another one I caught on the 30th of uh, December in 2019. Uh, the three images at the top there, I've got a 15 minutes apart. There's, there's, the, um, there's the, the event. And you can just about make it out on this one if, if you if you look hard. This one is disappeared completely. Um, these are the corresponding gong images from the same time. Um, so it, it, it wasn't there at 1046. It wasn't there at 1131. And it, it uh, maximized itself at around 1055 um, time. And I caught it just after that. I, as I say, I come across these things completely by accident, and this is a purely coincidence. And given the fact that I've seen several of them, I'm sure that um, they can't be that rare. Um, this is uh, one I saw quite recently, uh, in the 12th, about a month ago, in fact. Um, and uh, again, there were two of them this time, one in the southern polar regions and one in the north polar regions. Um, and if you look on the gong images, um, this one, the top one, persisted between from 1220 to 1225. The bottom one persisted between 1215 and 1224. After that, they're gone. Again, high latitudes. Um, I've no idea what they are, but they're interesting. And I don't generally look for them. And I don't quite often don't uh, look at the polar regions of the sun. Perhaps I should. Um, if I can catch three or four of these in this time, they, they, they don't think they can be that rare somehow. Um, so if anybody's interested, have a look at the, the polar regions. Remember, they're very short lived and use short image sequences. Um, and of course, there's a large image archive on Gong and daily movies. If anybody wants to, to while away a rainy afternoon. So thank you. That's all the slides I've got there. Thank you, Roger. If I... So if you stop sharing, then that will pop back to go. the, there we go. And so I think um, now do we want to go on to the Q&A? Yeah, please. And for the Q&A, what I was going to suggest is if people can in Zoom type in the Q&A, which they'll see down the bottom of the screen and on YouTube, I can keep an eye out for um, any um, questions which come in from there, if that works for people on the, uh, the panellists. Um, and Lynn, I'm not sure if you want to read out the questions or whether you want me to uh, do the uh, question management. Um, I Probably you, I can't find them at the moment. Say, I'll, I'll do the reading out of the questions. <laughs> okay. What I'd say is we'll see them coming in, which we can see in the Q&A, but the, uh, the attendees can't actually, I don't believe, can see them. But whilst we um, wait to see if people type in a few questions, we do have a few comments, which I might as well read out from the YouTube stream. Um, the first is from Paul Campbell saying, greetings from Galway City on the west coast of Ireland. Um, then we have Ronan Newman, which is great to hear the BAA solar section talks again since my visit to Scotland in late 2019. 
interesting talks and hopefully the good forecast for cycle 25 will come through. Mm. And then I also so. a comment that the Carrington event is a topic I have used in my previous talks, but Peter's archive will look gave me a new perspective on what actually happened. And uh, hi everyone from Mick Nichols. And I'd, I'd also add we've got a, a good attendance today between about 80 and 90 people across the Zoom and YouTube streams. Good. Oh, and we have our first questions coming in. Um, we have one from John Moel. Could the loops that Roger has sent be has seen be related to the newly discovered campfire events discovered by Solar Orbiter recently? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I suggest the, that's a good question to uh, to uh, point at the the director of the solar section. <laughs> <laughs> As if I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is a great question. I mean, uh, that's sort of the, all these mini flares that are known to be occurring, you know, all over the surface of the sun all the time. And to think in some way that magnetic uh, activity managed to transfer itself into, into heat. And that's how the solar corona is gets heated. Um, whether or not those spark off those transient uh, bubble prominences is, is a matter for conjecture. I'm still searching for some explanations. Um, I thought they might be related to arch filaments or uh, growing sunspot groups because they are very low lying, short lived features as well. But of course, with them occurring up at the poles, then that would seem to, to rule that particular theory out. So, no, I'm, I'm open for other people to come in and, and say what they think they are. <laughs> I, I did notice uh, about two weeks ago uh, what might be one of those bubbles, very, very high latitude. In fact, right at the top of the, the disc, I uh, hadn't appreciated until now what it was. But uh, I, I thank Roger for that. Well, I, I, I have no idea what they are. I said, if I saw two at the same time, one in the north and one in the south, they can't be that rare, can they, really? No, this is the value of the section of people actually observing. We've got uh, you know BMRs have, have been discovered by like, Kevin, and now they're open for us all to observe. And and now Roger's got these these bubble prominences that we can't explain. So something else to search for. I think you know that's a great attribute to this section that two members have, have found something worthy of note and worthy of further study. It worries me that over in America they might have known about these things for decades, and they've never mentioned them. Mm. I wonder if it's worth looking to see if there's any link with uh, polar faculty in terms of are there any bright polar faculty around at the time you see your... Yes, I, I, I was wondering that, Peter, I must say, uh, on, only because the word polar appears in both yeah, descriptions, well, I feel. <laughs> yeah. It might be worth having a quick look um, at the optical um, SDO HMI images at the same time as when you see your prominences and see whether they're um, any any very large polar faculty at the time? It's po possibly, yes. Uh, I mean, the um, I don't sure how long the gong images stay there. They, they do stay there for, for, for a while. Um, and I can get at the archive, generally speaking, for a month or two back, but I can't get back more than a, a year or two. Mm. I don't know about the optical ones. Well, the, yeah, the, the, the um, STO images are available for a long time going back. Does anybody know why the STO don't uh, image in hydrogen alpha? I think the, the closest is the 304 angstrom uh, wavelength. I guess the silence speaks for itself there. <laughs> <laughs> There does seem to be a gap in our hydrogen alpha observing that uh, the needs filling, so uh, more the merrier. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I showed that picture of my setup simply to illustrate that there's nothing complicated about it. It's, it's very simple. Um, that the best time for observing, usually from that window, which is uh, southwest facing ish, is, is the first thing in the morning, quite often before I'm dressed. <laughs> 
I, um, Andy, is it worthwhile starting to say some uh, some questions and answers on the um, oh, sorry questions on the um, on the uh, system? I didn't know whether you wanted to uh, to read those out and get those answers. Yes. So we, we can move on to the next one. So we, we've had. Um, I think looking at the total, probably three questions come in in total across um, Zoom and YouTube. So the next one's from Andrew Johnston, and particularly for Lynn, um, the predictions of Cycle 24, how recently were they made? Mm. Previous predictions have it similar to, uh, well, I think it's Cycle 20. He has a follow-up comment that Cycle 24 you mean Cycle 25, so I'm sure you'll, you'll know better than me. Yeah, um, I don't think I've got the dates to hand, but they, um, they're within the last few years. I don't think they're sort of exactly hot off the press. I've got them in front of me, but I can't actually see a date on either of them. Um, good questions. I can't, can't answer it. I, I know I did look at that when I, when I printed these off. Um, and as I say, all I can say is it's in the last few years, say about from 2014 up to present. I don't think it was earlier than that, but... Uh, Unfortunately, they don't seem to have the uh, the dates of these of these abstracts on them. So sorry, can't really tell you that. Um, no further information, I'm afraid. I think the, the paper um, relating to the um, terminal at the end of end of the 22 year cycle that was a fairly recent paper. Yeah, yeah, one was, and one was a, a few more years uh, yeah. older. Obviously, must have been the other one. I think that the. Uh, the sunspots, uh, you know, numbers in, in each hemisphere. But it's just so interesting that there's two academic papers and they're absolutely poles apart. I mean, <laughs> just they couldn't be further apart, really, could they, in the prediction? So it'll probably end up something in the middle. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll next take one from YouTube. And excuse me if I get the pronunciation of your name wrong. This is from Heidi Sio. And this is for Kevin. Have you ever turned the lunt? In the opposite direction away from the red side and was there anything to view? Yes I have but uh, no there wasn't very much to see at all. I, d I don't understand exactly why not but that that's the way it goes. Uh, but interestingly those Skylab images that I showed right at the start they go red side of centre wavelength and not in the opposite direction to blue side. And um, thanks to Peter Carson for saying that um, the attendees can see the Q&A in Zoom. Um, next, we have a question from Ronan Newman. Um, is there any more affordable H-alpha telescopes besides the Coronado PST? Well, I think Lund are quite reasonable in uh, in cost. I mean, you know, obviously there's two members of the panel have got Lund, so maybe you could inform us on uh, how much that set you back but uh, by comparison to Coronado and Solomax I think Lunt tend to be very uh, very competitive. But my small Lunt I don't think is, is available any longer they discontinued that telescope unfortunately you might be able to get them second hand. That my, would cost, my, my, that would cost you about 500 pounds. Yeah my 60 millimeter Lunt cost me just under 2000 but uh, I, I was in conversation with a friend of mine in Manchester last week and he was telling me that the telescope, the, the Coronados were bought, we bought four of them in 2006, cost us £200 each. Uh, now they're about 700 I think. Yeah, yeah, they are. Do you think it's just demand which has increased or prices gone up for us and any actual changes to the telescopes? I think it's just the price has gone up. I mean, uh, 2006 is a long time ago. Um, but uh, I'm very, I'm considering buying one of the quark uh, solar eyepieces, but they're they've come down in price, if I understand the websites uh, accurately. They've dropped from about thirteen hundred pounds down to about nine hundred and fifty. So I'm rather tempted to buy one of those uh, in a couple of months' time. You'll be interested to hear what uh, what your views are comparing that to sort of one of the traditional solar telescopes? Well, unlike Roger, I'm not technical when it comes, well, you, you've gathered that, I'm not technical when it comes to webcams and things like this. I've got the webcams, but I, and I've got a laptop computer, but uh, I rarely put the two together. Uh, I prefer to take the images with the, uh, with, the, with the DSLR. It's quicker. 
the, the, the disadvantage with that small lunt, uh, the advantage is it's small and it fits on a windowsill, of course. But the disadvantage is that it's only 35 millimetres. And from experiments I've done with it, I'm convinced it is diffraction limited, uh, as are the gong images. The advantage of the quark, if you can if you can get, get one like that, is you, it, it's, it's, it's only diffraction limited by a telescope you fit it to. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be fitting it to uh, an 80 millimetre uh, sky watcher. Yeah, you should get much better images than, than yep. the PST or the, the, the small lunt in that case. The, the reason that I bought the 60mm lunt was that about four, maybe five years ago now, we got a grant for the Manchester Astronomical Society to buy an 80mm lunt. And I was so impressed by that that I, I bought the 60mm when I could afford it. Um, the last question which I've got at the moment, oh, an another one's coming, but this is one from Diane. It's good afternoon all, an interesting session. My question is to Roger, any idea as to how big the bubbles could be? I haven't done the calculations, I have to say, but um, it'd be fairly easy to scale them off the, uh, off the, off the drawings, I must say. Um, I, I, I haven't done that, I'm afraid, that, but it's relatively straightforward. Perhaps I should do that. They're not, they don't seem to be that much um, higher than the sort of spicules. Uh, you can see the emission features along the, the sort of uh, the limb. Um, and, and they tend to average around about uh, 10,000 kilometres. So maybe they're just slightly higher than that or around about that height, would you say? Yes, perhaps that, that's true. That, that, that first one, the one I first took, was, was, was the biggest one I've seen. I haven't seen any more as big as that since. Yeah. Can I ask a question of uh, Peter? Um, you referred to Helio Viewer. Is that available online? It is, yes. It's a free software that I um, developed um, over a number of years. Uh, and that gives us the uh, coordinates of solar features, does it? Yes, that's right. So you can, um, if you import a, an image, as I showed, um, then yes, you can just click on um, a particular feature and it'll just give you the lat long and you can work out the, the longitude spread and, and, the, uh, and the size. It's, it's aimed primarily at my own drawings, mm -hmm. um, but you can, you can load in other, other types of images as well. Thank you. <clears throat> if you want any more information, I just let, just drop me an email. And I'll... Yes, sure. Yeah. We have a comment from Mick Nichols, which was down to the um, the previous discussion, which is the quarks are excellent, 0.5 angstrom band pass two compared to the PST of one angstrom. Yeah. And, and I guess what that would mean is that would make it give you um, a better contrast. Would that be right? It should increase the contrast, but um, what might be a slight downside in my, con uh, my interest of bipolar magnetic regions is that the field of view is much smaller with a quark because they uh, they have a built-in uh, Barlow lens I think it's a time for times for Barlow so I'll be looking at the detail within these magnetic regions but I won't be seeing the big picture so the the smaller telescopes won't be binned just yet yeah, I think selecting a small a quark or a, a telescope is, is a big subject. <laughs> we have a comment from Ronan Newman, which is we might learn more on the solar polar regions from the two solar probes. Yeah. And then we have a question from um, Andrew, Andrew Devi, or possibly a comment. Um, it will be interesting to capture the dynamics of one of these polar bubble features at a long focal length, say at 30 seconds between images to inspect it as a GIF, GIF animation? There's a project for you, Andy. As you're out in Spain, you'll get far more opportunity than us. <laughs> you, you, you can get, uh, you can see these images on Gong, of course. If you look at the, look at the large um, images uh, on the archive, they, they are there and there are, there are it depends which camera it is. The, obviously, the, the, the Learmont one's pretty good. The Cerro Tololo one's pretty good. But uh, the Udi pair and the um, the other ones are not so good. 
Yeah, some are quite sharp, aren't they? And fantastic yeah. images. Others tend to, yeah, quite washed out. It's got to be quite selective. I go on there every day and download the best of them. And that's all the questions which we have received. Okay. So if, if there's no one, oh, just have a let's see. Oh, we, have, we have a comment, which is from uh, Gerard McIntaggart. Hi, I recently purchased a Coronado 90mm Solar Max 3 series hydrogen mm. alpha nice. with rich view tune, tuning, fast, £6,700 from Optic Star. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Yes. So, so, yeah, a, a little more than the, the smaller telescopes then. Would mind having a look through that one then? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think we've got, got to appreciate that these hydrogen alpha telescopes have only been a, around affordable, I should say, to the amateur for about 25 years. Yeah. So we're still very much in, on the learning curve. That's only two rotations, uh, two cycles rather. There's no doubt technology, I mean, it's just advancing so fast, you know, in, in solar observing. I mean, the, the images, you know, from 10 years ago, you know, were good when I received them, but now I get this spectacular. I mean, everyone's images come into the section. They're absolutely amazing, you know, fantastic. So well done. All the section images ca uh, carry on the good work. They're quite stunning. Uh, if you could be in my office when I open up the files, you'd hear a lot of, oh, you know, my God, and <laughs> good grief. <laughs> so I, I know you don't get to appreciate that, but they are absolutely breathtaking, some of them. Does that about bring us to the end, Andy, if there's no more um, questions? I think so. There's um, no more new questions have come in on Zoom or on YouTube. So, yes, I think that brings us to the end. OK, in that case, I'd really like to to thank you, Andy, for hosting it and uh, resolving all our technical issues, of which we always have a few. And you're so calm. It's absolutely wonderful to, to watch you resolve the issue. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, and also... A big thank you to all our speakers as well, Peter, Kevin, and to Roger for a great presentation. So well done, everybody, and thank you. Uh, and thanks for everyone for your attendance as well. We've got quite a lot of people online. So I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, I'd be very glad to hear of your feedback in due course and whether you'd like us to, to do another one. And maybe, you know, now we've got Zoom, do this on a more regular basis. So uh, on that, uh, happy solar observing. Let's hope for a, a good cycle 25. Let's hope that first prediction comes true and we get some roaring flares. That'd be great. But uh, I think that's it. So we'll sign out and uh, I wish you a merry afternoon. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Everybody. Thank you very much, Lynn. Okay, bye bye. bye, -bye. And, and if, bye. if anyone um, has a telescope without a hydrogen alpha filter on it, then in two weeks' time we have the Deep Sky Section annual meeting, which is also being held at a webinar as a webinar. And that's starting at 2.30 on Saturday, the 6th of March. Great. Thanks, Thanks Andrew. So. Thank you. See you then. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.